We've been fighting a long time. We have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela. Hello, everybody, wherever, whenever you are, because we're going to the land out under the Father Robert Nixon OSB, who translated the book Humility by a guy you may have heard before, uh, some Thomas Akempis. Father, well, for you, good evening. How, good, how are you doing? Good evening, Steve. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. Very nice to talk to you. Same here, same here. So, Thomas Akempis wrote was something more than the imitation? He did indeed. So, of course, the book which uh, which is his total masterpiece and which, you know, uh, every Catholic has read, I hope, is The Imitation of Christ. And this is um, one of the, the greatest ca uh, classics of all time. That book is, um, uh, until recent times, it was the most translated book ever. So um, I think probably Harry Potter might have passed it now. But, I was going to say, are um, you trying to catch up with it with this one? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so over, over 2,000 different editions of it are, are available, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, but the fascinating thing about Thomas Akempis is that although he wrote that one book, which is immensely popular, he actually wrote quite a lot of other stuff as well. And um, his collected works come to three volumes, each of which is like well over a thousand very closely printed pages. So um, uh, uh, his other writings have been uh, largely overlooked um, for various reasons. I'm not too sure exactly why, because they're, they're actually quite fantastic, as this particular um, compilation shows. So this, this compilation includes um, a, a short work of his on the virtue of humility, which is something he was, uh, was he saw as being very central to, uh, to his relationship with God and his fellow man. Um, as well as another book of his, The Elevation of the Mind Towards God, which um, shows a more mystical side of Thomas than the imitation of Christ, perhaps. And then there's also a, a collection of, of, of his own prayers, which are like uh, very personal outpourings of his devotion to, to Christ and the Blessed Virgin and, and other saints whom he took as his particular patron. Yeah, I noticed that too. Is that it's the same author but a different genre in this one versus the imitation. Uh, uh, what made you pick this oh, yeah. one? Well, um, you know, I, I, I decided to go through his complete works. Okay. And so the yeah. So this and, is this um, is what this is the first of many from you then. Uh, well, quite possibly. So so um, yeah. So um, you know, I was kind of I've, I've done like an, a number of retreats and courses and things on the imitation of Christ and that period when he was writing. You know, the late um, late medieval times, uh, just transitioning into the uh, Renaissance. To me, is a very fascinating period. Um, because people were dealing with big changes in society at that time. So, um, so I, I, what, what inspired me was to go through these, these huge volumes of works and you know, to pick out the ones which I thought were, were particularly um, inspiring and gave a particular you know, taste of, of, of what he was, he was write, like writing about. Uh -huh. So um, he, amongst them, we've also got like his conferences to novices and classes and sermons and lives of, of, of saints as well as people who were within his own religious community. So yeah, but, but as I said, he lived during a time of great um, social transition. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, until the end of the Middle Ages, people had tended to assume that things were going to keep on going the same way as they'd always been or as they'd been within their own recollection. But at this stage, there was the rise of urbanization, um, uh, printing, 
secularization. And of course, then there was the whole kind of Protestant thing starting to ferment as well. So yeah, so these were all uh, real challenges at the time. What was one of the more profound things you read in this book part in particular? Okay, so this is uh, from his writing about humility. And I think what he says here um, is, is very true and strikes a chord with everyone. In this life, the hazards and the attacks of the devil assail us both from the right and from the left, from both the outside world and from within our own hearts. There is no more powerful weapon against these hazards and attacks than true humility and devout prayer made with a pure conscience. With each proud thought that enters the mind and every haughty sentiment that springs up in the heart, the soul encounters a new snare or trap. So, you know, um, I think this, he's, he's very perceptive, um, you know, and a great, great uh, insight into the reality that we're, we're fighting against forces of evil, temptations and everything, um, not just in the obvious things from the outside and everything, you know, temptation, sins and, and those things which are obvious, but also from within our own selves, you know. We've got this uh, kind of battlefield going on within our own hearts. So, you know, there's need for, for constant vigilance. And, and I think that's one of the things that this, this uh, writing on humility, you know, it calls us always to look at ourselves um, carefully, you know, and, and to ask what's really going on there, you know. Um, yeah, I like the line. And uh, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, you, no, you go, you, you go, go ahead, Steve. I was just going to say, I like that line. Is I think it's like the third sentence in the book. Uh, but without humility, no amount of study of sacred scripture or theology, nor any efforts of good works, are able to achieve anything lasting. In vain are all our labors unless they are accompanied with humil by humility. Well, that's very true. That's very true. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's one, of the, uh, one of the tricks of the devil to to mix temptation up with good things not only with bad things you know so you know you think well study of theology and and charitable works and everything they're fantastic yeah, of course they are but then in the same way the uh, seeds of pride uh, can be sown within these things you know so what starts off as something which is done purely for for love of jesus then you know little by little becomes something which is done for one's sense of, of, of self and importance and so forth, you know. And um, of course, when he was writing, um, you know, there were a lot more religious people, I mean, people in religious life than what there are now. A lot of people actually did see it as a career path back in those days. Mm -hmm. so, so there was this ambition thing going on. But that's, I think, true in, in, every, in every person, in every situation in life that we were called to serve us, to serve God as well as we can. But at the same time, we need to be careful always whether, um, you know, whether the devil is trying to get a foot in there through, uh, through egotism, you know? Um, yeah. And it's, it's not always that easy to discern. You know? <laughs> That's for darn sure. Yeah, you think you're doing something good and all of a sudden you're puffed up. I, well, that kind of like that I'm the man uh, attitude. Well, that's that that that's right. You you can you can think you know you're fighting for God, and then realize that you know in fact you you started to fight for yourself. You know yeah, that that little so clip. Then, maybe well, I'm the yeah. baddies. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, you know I think it, I think it's good always to think, you know maybe I'm wrong about this, <laughs> and it's possible. You know that is something so, right there I'm, that nobody says anymore. These the uh, I remember. Uh, that's what, I guess that's one thing about the extreme ownership of uh, Jocko that I've been liking is nobody takes really ownership of any of their problems or faults. They blame others. No one ever, yeah. A lot of people don't say, I am wrong or incapable. It's almost like a sign of weakness if they say that. Yeah, that's very true, you know. And um, what, wanting to blame the world or blame other people for, for your own problems, you know, and you think, well, um, 
if, if you look at your own life, you know, uh, for most people objectively, you say, well, the same problem popped up once and twice and three times. Maybe it's me who's causing this problem, <laughs> not everyone else around. And then also, as you said, you know, there's some, the idea that admitting that you're wrong is a sign of weakness. And I think that that actually is quite, uh, quite opposite to reality, because being able to admit when you're wrong and when you've made a mistake is actually a sign uh, of, of strength. Mm -hmm. The need to refuse that, to say, well, I'm never wrong, you know, uh, is, is, is a weakness because it's a, it's a defense mechanism. So, so to be open, to accept, yeah, sometimes I'm wrong. You know, um, to look back and say, yeah, I was wrong about that, or, you know, my, my idea was wrong, or, or I didn't do this so well, or whatever. Um, you know, it's a, I think it's a, it's a kind of strength, and, uh, you know, we should, we should learn to embrace that more. Um, as a sign of, of strength you know, and, and be ready to say sorry you know, it's, a, it's a great thing you know. or uh, um, how about handle criticism yeah um, yeah you know and to, to see criticism you know to think well um, this is actually an opportunity for learning uh -huh. um, even if even if the criticism you know might might not be right it, it at least it tells you honestly about how a certain person feels about what you've done you know or what you're doing so i think well yeah it's something to take on board um all the time and you know this is this is a sign of of strength you know in the same way that a that a strong person you know doesn't get upset if they get bitten by a mosquito or whatever you know to realize yeah criticism so of course they're, they're part of life you know um and, and, and to, to take them on board. And I think, you know, when we look at, at, at Christ himself, this is something which, um, you know, we, we hear about his, his preaching and everything. And then you read through the gospel and you realize there were always people who were criticizing him, yeah. Yeah, whether they were Pharisees or unbelievers or whatever. And he was actually bearing this uh, all the time. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, and, and, and he didn't let it. Um, stop him, and and he never really reacted um, with 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 hatred or with anger or anything. You know, he he knew how to uh, to express himself in a reasonable and moderate way, and he did that consistently and very faithfully. So I think that's a, a tremendous model for uh, for all for all Catholics in the modern world. I think it was Saint Alphonsus that might have talked about those who look cool and calm on the outside but inside they're Mount Vesuvius waiting to explode and if they have some kind of wrong criticism someone says something <laughs> yeah, wrong a, about them yeah um, you know I think I think that's that's quite true and probably for you know for most people well probably for myself I'm a little bit like that you know that there can often be a lot going on inside that you don't show on the surface you know and it's probably a blessing that we don't show everything on the surface because it gives us then the benefit of, of reflecting and keeping. So I think that's one of the, you know, uh, very useful social disciplines of Christianity. Um, if we feel angry, if we feel hurt, give it a little bit of time. Wait till the feelings go away before responding to it. Yeah. What were one of the favorite prayers that you found in here? I saw like the prayer for detachment, uh, yeah. prayer of knowing and following the way that leads to eternal life. Which which one was one? I mean, <laughs> I want to say like your favorite one on here. I mean, th some of the prayers are like four or five pages long. They are, they are. And, um, you know, I, I think that when he was writing these, these were um, things written spontaneously, so he was actually like praying as he was as he was writing. Um, so, I think um, one which I really like here is is the uh, the tenth one, a prayer for patience in time of tribulation and anxiety of heart. Lord God, my beloved Holy Father, I am not worthy to be visited by you, but rather I deserve punishment with harsh blows. Since I have sinned and shown myself ungrateful in innumerable ways, I deserve to carry many heavy burdens and to be afflicted with many tribulations. Unlike my good and faithful brethren, I am entirely unworthy to be refreshed by your divine consolation and to be included amongst the guests at your holy banquet. So it begins with this recognition, you know, that 
you know, um, it, you might say, well, it's a bit over the top, but, but no, we recognize that, that we are actually unworthy, all of us. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, nevertheless, I beseech you, Holy Father and sweet and merciful Lord, deign to count me as one of your servants. Let me be even the least and lowliest of your slaves, so that I may thus be part of your household with all the others, whose footprints I am not worthy to keep. These have many and great consolations for you. Rightly do you love them indeed, with a great and special love. For me, who am the least and most wretched of all, it will suffice if you do not spare me from afflictions and adversities. May I be as one dead to the world and hidden in a tomb, whose very memory has perished without a single trace remaining. Christ, eternal wisdom of the Father, let me contemplate my own condition in such a manner often. Let me ever be mindful of the account I shall have to render of myself at the future judge and the eternal life to come. Doing thus, I shall prepare myself to appear before your heavenly throne with humble prayers and tears of repentance. And very, uh, very moving, I think, what he's saying, you know, he's imploring He'll be happy even if he's counted as the least and lowest of the servants of God. And, you know, when we think about heaven and, and the glories of heaven and everything, if we just get in, in the last place, yeah. you know, that's beyond anything that this world can possibly offer. Yeah, that's not like getting to Euchre um, seats in a stadium. You're, it's, uh, you're not upset. <laughs> No, <laughs> no. Um, so, 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 this um, imploring God in this way that you know, when when we recognise that we haven't, when we either we've done things wrong, or we you know haven't done things as well as we could have or should have, you know, Father, you know, just let me in now. Give me the benefit of your mercy. And, you know, if we, if we sincerely ask for God's mercy in that way, then he will always give it to us. You know, because he, he gave his son to die on the cross for our salvation. Um, and in that context, you know, he, 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 he's not going to withhold salvation as long as we accept for that is, is humility of, of recognizing that that we didn't deserve this salvation, but that, you know, it's, it's given to us through the blood of God as the gift of God. I think a very uh, awe-inspiring thing. Yeah, it goes that the whole idea of uh, God loved us to folly, since he didn't have to go through all of that for all of us and would have done it just for one. But you think about that, to step back, and he would have done that for us. Who are we in the big scheme of things? Yeah. So, well, well, that, that's that, that's right. I mean, you know, God, God made us out of the dust, you know, by His own power and everything. We have, you know, no claim on His mercy or love or anything. But what He gives us is is purely out of His own goodness, which is a which is an infinite goodness, and He desires that His glory and love and and, and that's what we're each destined for. And the only way we can miss out on that is by uh, this thing which you know, the devil planted in us right at the very beginning. Mm. And that's, that's pride. Um, you know, you think about Adam and Eve, you know, in the garden. And when, the, when the serpent spoke to, to Eve, he was appealing to her pride, you know. He was saying, you know, you, can, you don't really need God's love and mercy. Thing in her um, responded to that positively, and then, of course, Adam responded as well. If we look at all, virtually all sins, they relate to um, to that to that thing of pride within us. And um, I think it's good to see the pride that's within us, not not as a part of our strength, mm -hmm. but as a symptom of our weakness. Yeah. And uh, you know, in our in our culture, if we see a person who's like overtly proud or arrogant or whatever, we sometimes call that strength of character or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But in reality, it's not. You know, 
in reality it's, it's weakness. Um, because pride implies a dependence on and humility puts that aside and says, I am who I am in relation to God, which is who I really am. So it then allows true humility viewed in that way as uh, an honest uh, presence you, you, you know, an honest uh, selfhood in the presence of God cuts off pride completely. Because what God uh, thinks of you is a million, billion times more important than what the whole world thinks of you. you know? And um, you know, if, if we've done something wrong, we've sinned or failed in some way, God knows it already. We don't, there's no point in defending ourselves or covering it up or whatever. You know, so you know, uh, so this is where humility comes in. Yeah, I think it was Chris uh, Austin that said that uh, defend yourself once, and uh, I'm paraphrasing, but then after that, forget about it. It's uh, you'll you'll see it on Judgment Day if it's if it gets worse. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That well, that's 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 quite true. You know, when you think about the the awesome nature of that final judgment, which is going to be um, something which is conducted with absolute openness and honesty there'll be no room for concealing or covering up uh-huh. or or defending in that way everything will be completely open um which on a certain level can be a source of you know of, of fear and anxiety but i also think it should be for catholics a source of great hope uh-huh. yeah? because the god who, who sees deeply within our heart um, if, if, if we're oriented towards him and, and if we love him, then he will forgive us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing, then it's going to be like a very cool movie to see how the entire thing played out. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that doesn't we'll, mean you we'll, can do we'll anything have... you want down here. You're going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> so the book, it's not that big. As you can see it on the screen, it's you could read it in a day, but you probably should maybe like a chapter to meditate, maybe a day. Maybe you could read it in a week and just yeah, read yeah, a chapter. I think, I, look, I, 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 I think that, that that's right. The idea is to read a, a chapter a day. I mean, if you if you sat down and read it like from cover to cover, like a novel or something, I think you'd, 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 you wouldn't, you'd lose a lot of it. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot to take away and to reflect upon. And uh, a lot of things, you know, you you, you read um, here, I like that prayer I just read, you know, and you might think um, think about it for, for uh, a period of time, and then you see different things which you might not have, have realized before. And I think it can often be in the things which we read, which might at first trouble us or confuse us, that the greatest riches lie. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, with that prayer which I read then, you know, you think, well, why, why is he saying, you know, that he, he is the least and lowest of all the brothers within his community? You know, you think about it um, for a while, and that might initially seem to be something which is kind of confusing or troubling, because he certainly was a good, you know, very good monk. Um, but then to realize that we can, we can truly consider ourselves to be the least of other people because we know our own sins best. We don't know other people's sins, but we know our own failings. And for that reason, our own failings and everything should be much more in our consciousness uh, and are open to us. So we should, I think a good, very good policy is to concentrate on the merits of others and concentrate on the shortcomings of ourselves. So you shouldn't probably go mm. out on in public and complain about everybody and woe is me and look at me and how please yeah. feel sorry for me and be mad at others well, well, for things. That, that, that's that's right because you know criticizing other people is is in fact a, a kind of covert way of boasting oneself. You know, if you say this person's doing this wrong or this person's not doing this right, you know, they're falling short here or they shouldn't be doing this. What you're actually saying is, I don't do any of those things. I do all those things better than this person I'm criticizing. You know, so it's a double-edged sword, and uh, you know, you don't want to 
criticizing uh, other people can see, can often seem more socially acceptable than boasting about yourself and not that many people like, boast about themselves um, but a lot of people do criticize others and i think they both reflect the same kind of dynamic so you know um uh, I, I think uh, it's often best to, to let other people you know speak for themselves that their own actions and everything because you know we we're not we're not there to judge and that's not our job we've got one who does judge and he judges with perfect truth and perfect justice but also perfect love and perfect mercy we'll have the link for the book underneath in the show notes underneath the video here uh get one or two hand it to a friend maybe for christmas or if you watch this after christmas get for the next one i don't know uh father nixon uh appreciate it maybe uh a future uh how would you say a bookshelf of Thomas Akempa's books are coming out uh, that people do not do not know existed? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it would be fantastic to, to undertake the project of translating all of his works. That would be, I think, for me, would be something that would take me maybe, uh, maybe uh, the next decade or so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. And thank you, for, uh, thank you for coming on here. I'll let you go. And uh I give uh, give Father well, Salabes for him being down in down, the land down under. They're having some troubled times right now. Yeah, indeed. And uh, Steve, so uh, all the best for Christmas and all the best for Christmas for, uh, for all your viewers. So God bless you all. Thank you, Padre. Thank you.